Good evening, everyone. A quorum being present, this meeting of the board's curriculum committee will come to order. The informational summary which describes the committee's last meeting has been provided. It does not require committee approval. Um, hello to everyone who's here, and we are expecting one other member, and we'll introduce him when he arrives. And I'll turn it over to Dr. McComas. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, if I could invite Ms. Shea to come forward and share with the committee uh, our summer curriculum workshops that are scheduled. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Ms. Adequoya, this is the day we met last summer, so I'll be so sad we won't be there this year. Um, so I'm here to describe for you our summer curriculum workshops. Um, they will be happening <laughs> this summer. The dates for the entirety of the summer curriculum workshop, they begin on July 8th and they run through August 2nd. However, not every workshop is of the same length. So we have um, some workshops are five days, some are 10. It depends on the nature of the workshop. Um, and I actually have a handout for you. <laughs> you have the hot seat because you're on the end. <laughs> Thank so you. The, the slide details no, the overview. Um, I'll make sure I collect them from Mr. McMillian and Mr. Offerman. Today. We will be in two main locations this summer. Um, the last several years we've been able to be in one location. That proved more and more challenging um, for a high school to be able to host us all because of their own summer um, offerings and then the cleaning schedule. So it worked out this year that we're gonna be in two locations, Parkville High and Towson High School, although we will all be at the kickoff on July 8th and you will a formal invitation will follow for all, for all of the board members and we hope um, there. We also open to two visitor days. Um, this year the visitor days will be on July 16th and July 18th and more information and an invitation will come as well. Um, this is a great opportunity. Last year we were able to have visitors both from the board but also from our Student Government Association. We had some principals that were able to attend and certainly lots of central office folks and it's a great opportunity to really see behind the curtain and see how um, curriculum is developed. The handout that I gave to you details every single workshop in more specific detail. Um, they are organized by location. Um, so the first several pages are those workshops that will be at Parkville High School and then they are grouped by office. Um, so you can see on that first page all of the courses that will be written under career and technology education. Hopefully what you're going to start to see is this is um, should start to sound familiar because these are the same things that we talked about with the phase forms. These are a lot of the same materials that we've described in terms of instructional materials. So this is kind of how it all comes together and this is our opportunity for some ongoing revision as well as the development of some of those new courses that we just recently brought forward um, for planning. Um, so just to give you a little bit about the scope, um, we have over 75 workshops that we will be um, holding this summer. We hire close to 400 teachers every summer. As you know, we have a proud tradition of curriculum by our teachers for our teachers. The workshops represent all of our content areas in the Department of Academics, but they also include um, workshops with our partners in the Office of Special Education, the Office of School Counseling, the Office of ESOL, and the Office of College and Career Readiness. Um, so it is, um, it's really an incredible event undertaking, <laughs> I should say. And so just last slide is just to detail um, that handout that you have, um, which describes in more details exactly what we are working on this summer. So we hope that each of you will have an opportunity to join us. As I mentioned, Ms. Adequoya came last year um, and she actually visited every single workshop. She used the same handout as a check sheet <laughs> and she worked her way around Newtown High School and visited every workshop. And um, it is a really wonderful opportunity to talk with our teachers and listen in on that um, really critical thinking and that deep work that they do around the standards and around offering um, perspectives and opportunities for our students to see themselves in our curriculum. It's super fun. <laughs> For whom are the capstone, the research, and the seminar designed? Um, uh, what, For the AP, the AP capstone research. Oh, so I'm so I didn't see the AP okay. part of that. I'm sorry. No, okay, that's okay. So yep. that's for an AP class. Mm -hmm. And will that be an AP class that they will sit for the test? 
Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that gave you science? No, it gave, it's, a, it's not English. It's not, it's like English and average. Okay. Yeah. It's oh, its own. okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for me about any of the workshops? All right. And as always, if you have questions that emerge over the next couple weeks, you're welcome to email us and we'll be happy to answer your questions. I do have one more question, sorry. No worries. Sure. Do we have any feedback from the um, mathematics audit that will be incorporated into this curriculum? That's a great question. So unfortunately, because of the delays in timing, um, we have not actually begun the audit work. Um, so there was a length of time, both from the board approval and then um, with the contract execution. So last week, we had our first engagement, if you will, um, where we had a phone call to identify all the materials they need. Um, at this point, I don't have the date off the top of my head. I believe the first time we're gonna get feedback, we had hoped to be able to have the feedback. As you remember, when we were bringing forward the audit, that was a big part of my concern about waiting was because I had hoped to be able to use the workshop time. It does not appear that that's gonna be possible because of the delays um, that we encountered with the contract execution. Um, I believe at some point in the summer, we should get our first engagement back. So um, we also write curriculum all year long, and it'll probably have to be a part of that work instead, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that our, um, the summer is our largest production time because that's when we actually have uh, 400, 400 teachers, teachers <laughs> available to actually focus on development of curriculum. So this, the year-long curriculum development moves at a much slower production rate, just to, to be aware. And we were able to finally get the full contract signed related to the audit, was it last week? The week before last. Yep. So. Um, Last Keep in mind that first. once the board mm -hmm. uh, provides, a, the full board authorizes authority, uh, contract spending authority, that's then when we work with the companies to finalize the contract. So those things aren't done before the board gives us permission to do it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And so if I could have Dr. Wistead and Ms. Ryder come forward. Um, as part of our ongoing effort to help um, induct you into all the different facets of curriculum instruction in the school system, we'll be doing an overview presentation this afternoon on special education services and, and the staffing plan that goes with supporting special education services. Sure. Um, I also want to introduce Mr. Jerry Easterly, who is the principal at Bottom Monument School. Um, it was a request of one of the board members for uh, the special schools to be highlighted, so that's going to be part of the presentation. We're going to share um, all of the programs that we have so that um, the curriculum committee and others that are listening have a better understanding of what happens um, in BCPS with special education services, the staffing plan. This way, when we are bringing either contracts or content for curriculum forward, you know, you'll have maybe a better context of that information. So Ms. Ryder is going to begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, we're very uh, excited to share with you the types of services that we offer here within Baltimore County Public Schools. We do offer what's called a continuum of services, and that is for our earliest learners from birth all the way up to age 21. Um, and then we also want to ensure that to the maximum extent possible, we uh, want to ensure the students are receiving their services in the least restrictive environment. So when we say LRE, that's the acronym for least restrictive environment, and it kind of goes something from this most inclusive to all the way to our most restrictive setting that we have here within BCPS. Um, our students, um, again, must be receiving instruction to the maximum extent possible with their non-disabled peers, and they also must have access to general education curriculum. And how the curriculum is implemented, um, it's, it's differentiated and it um, changes based upon the needs of our students, and that's what we call specially designed instruction, and that looks different for our students as well based upon the decisions that are made at the, I, at the IEP team. So how the continuum works is really based upon the delivery of services. And services are what are determined by an IEP team, which um, involves the parent, involves a special education teacher, the IEP chair, 
Um, it can also involve um, related service providers, um, such as an SLP or occupational therapist. And that's what they're really looking at, the frequency, which is how often the service is happening. And then we're also looking at intensity, which is the duration of the service. And the service, what they're referring to, is really about specialized instruction. So when we're looking at the continuum, it's how those services are provided, what is the amount of service time, how much time is the child in the general education setting versus outside of the general education setting. And then this also links into um, the staffing, because our staffing is also aligned to the LREs and the ratios. So in LREA, it would be um, the assumption that the general education teachers, mostly the service providers, that would be a 16 to 1 ratio. LREB is a mix. Um, that's a 40 to 79 percent, so that is where it is mostly the general special education teacher with also the combination of the general education teacher. LREC is outside general education, so that's in the self-contained setting, and that is where the um, primary service provider would be the special education teacher. And then we also have self-contained models and the special education schools, those are separate public day schools, and we also refer to them as special schools here in the county. Oops, sorry, I went to it. So special education eligibility there's something that we call an October count. And the October count is reported once annually from Baltimore County Public Schools to MSDE, and it's provided by all of the LEAs. And this is an important count for us because this is the count that is used to determine staffing overall as well. Um, this count is shared with MSD and it includes the count for the children that have a disability and are also actively receiving special education services. We've um, continually to grow at a very rapid rate with our special education services here within Baltimore County Public Schools. Just five years ago, I think when I was in the position, we were at 13,000-ish, and now we're 15,313, and that was at the onset of the school year. So we're already kind of surpassed that at this point. That number also can, um, change and can fluctuate on a daily basis for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, because IEP teams are making decisions on a daily basis, we could have some students that are newly identified to the IEP team um, to have an IEP through the IEP team process. We could have students who are moving into our county already with those services identified or su su uh, students new to the county too who we also have to implement their IEP for um, to provide what's called FAPE. We are growing rapidly. The disability codings where we see the most growth within Baltimore County Public Schools would be developmental delay, so those are for our earliest learners. Um, students with autism, and that is also a national trend, and, that's a, and also with multiple disabilities. So with multiple disabilities, you could have autism and then another disability with it. Um, autism, sometimes we also see that throughout lots of our disability codings, not just for the um, disability coding of autism. It could come up under other health impairment, it could come up under developmental delay. So sometimes autism, the number looks a little bit smaller, but we do have students who have autism and they also have another mm -hmm. um, impacting disability. But that is definitely one of which we're seeing the most growth within Baltimore County. We are um, growing so much that we are at 13.5% of our total school enrollment. Some trends that we have seen with our special education eligibility would definitely be initial eligibility. And then we've had a huge increase in students moving into Baltimore County already with IEPs. So we call those new to county enrollments. Um, that's definitely a trend for us. And something else that we've noticed as a trend is whenever there is a um, type of national tragedy or event that occurs um, in the country, such as a hurricane, um, you know, in Puerto Rico or in Texas, then we also start to see more students moving into Baltimore County with IEPs accessing those services. Um, Baltimore County kind of serves as the hub for a lot of great um, resources such as Johns Hopkins and a lot of hospitals. So we are really the hub of a lot of great resources um, that are, a lot of our families are moving into our county so they can access those medical services and resources too. Birth to Five. So our Birth to Five is a kind of subset office within the Office of Special Education and it's their responsibility to oversee these areas here. We have infants and toddlers, community-based instruction, early childhood programs, and child find. So service for infants and toddlers and our young children between birth and age five, they include several programs and activities, and the whole goal is to improve developmental outcomes for our earliest learners. Um, the Baltimore County Infants and Toddlers Program, it provides early intervention services for infants and for toddlers from birth to pre-kindergarten age for students who have developmental delay. Um, disabilities and sometimes certain health conditions that are likely to lead to, lead to atypical, 
atypical developments later on. Uh, many of the students who are eligible for services do have developmental delays, autism, speech delays, Down syndrome, or severely premature infants who we also provide um, the services to. The Infants and Toddlers Program, it is a state and it's also a federally mandated interagency program. And we have kind of two parts. Part B would be anything that is for special education services at school age. And then part C would really be speaking to our Infants and Toddlers programs um, prior to um, receiving services in school. There's three agencies that work together um, collaboratively. We have the Baltimore County Public Schools, which we would support the teachers and the related service provider staffing. We also work collaboratively with the Baltimore County um, Department of Health, who support through the nursing um, agencies and service coordinators. And then we also have to work in tandem with Baltimore County Department of Social Services, and they would um, provide the services in support of social work. So it's really these three inner agencies that come together to provide the services for infants and toddlers. Um, just a few numbers. Go ahead. Sure. Mm -hmm. As a CASA, I worked with at-risk kids mm -hmm. and um, who were identified at a very young age as needing services. Mm -hmm. How has how Baltimore County made aware um, that a child needs services, especially if, I mean, my experience was the children with whom I worked weren't even taken to the doctors. Mm -hmm. So by the time they were, um, you know, they had some hurdles. So how are we identifying them? Are we taking referrals from DSS? Yes, we do. That's one um, way in which that, and that really was why we have to work collaboratively with those outside agencies as well, because we want to ensure that they are aware of the services. We do have a child find referral process I'll speak to in a few minutes, but it's really about um, having those connections with very early on the pediatricians, the doctors, and the communities, and making sure that they can help us to identify. Then also, um, for those who may not have those services, we definitely have to work on um, publicizing and making sure we're reaching out to those people who don't necessarily have them. And the is there a means test um, for allowing a child to become part of infants and toddlers? So it, they do an assessment. So. Um, it, a typically, your pediatrician or some outside agency would say call um, child find or infants and toddlers depending on the age of your child and then they schedule a meeting initially. They do um, assessments, multiple assessments depending on what the needs, like we do a screening when they first call to see uh, what the specific needs would be this way, like for the example of infants and toddlers, they go into the home to do the assessment so they would know what staff to send based on what information they were getting in that initial screening. And then they determine if the child and family qualify for what we call an IFSP, which is the fam Individualized Family Service Plan, support plan. Um, and so then, but if your child's over three, then you go through the Child Find Center and it, you bring your child in to a school-based type setting and they do the assessment there. I guess what I'm asking though, if, if you, are children who don't maybe have access to good health insurance, let's say, who might be between oh. the crack of Medicaid and private insurance. Um, is it expected that families who have private insurance would provide these services for the, their children themselves, mm -hmm. or they would be just mm -hmm. as eligible as any other child who met the requirements? And yeah, yeah, the insurance has nothing to do with it. Okay. You're eligible for this. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And um, just as, um, Dr. Woods had shared about the IFSP, so that is really what we have prior to the IEP. So it's the Family Service Plan, and it really is that whole Part C intervention system. And just to give you a number, last year, um, students are actually able to stay on the IFSP. Beginning in 2010, there was a change that if a child is determined eligible for special ed at age three, um, they're given a choice to stay on the IFSP or to move to the IEP, to move to the IEP, and we had 553 families who actually chose to stay to continually receive the IFSP services. So that was Part C, IFSP. Um, just to give you a couple of other numbers, we did have um, 2,502 new children who were referred to our Baltimore County Infants and Toddlers Program in 2018, and that represents actually an 18.1 percent increase since 2013. So when you kind of saw that line graph, we've actually had an 18.1 percent increase in the referrals coming in um, for that. We've had 1,353 children and families were receiving services 
as noted on that October count that I shared with you, which is a 9.3% increase over October 2013. So each calendar week, we actually have to um, monitor all of the referrals that are coming into the system, and we receive an average of 48 new referrals for young children in need of developmental assessment, and then approximately 26 new children and families begin receiving those ongoing services. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely very much a fluid process, and we have students um, who are moving in or we receive the referrals through Child Find, and this is before they get into the school age. Um, the other part too, just to share the staffing model that we have for that, we do have um, team leaders. So we have five team leaders to help to oversee the infants and toddlers um, program, and that's included in our staffing plan. We also have um, lots of SLPs, PTs, OTs, psychologists, and nurses as well who help to provide that multidisciplinary effort in supporting infants and toddlers, and that's also captured in the staffing plan. We have 41.2 teachers, um, infants and toddlers teachers, we have 15.3 paraeducators and representatives um, and then the interagency staff members that we work with. So that's kind of like an overview of infants and toddlers. <laughs> um, for our community-based instruction, so this is for students who receive preschool inclusion service hours. And the purpose of this is to support preschool children, though, in a natural setting. So that it's not the preschool or the pre-K programs here within the county. It's the preschool programs that are outside of um, the Baltimore County Public Schools where they're receiving their services. The service provider for these um, young learners, it is a special education teacher. And we also do have paraprofessionals that are trained to modify and adapt curriculum. And it's really to provide um, services in a very natural setting for the children. That's the, that's the goal of that. So who receives services? It's preschool children within Baltimore County who do have an IEP, indicating that services are to be provided in the community setting. Um, the services, again, at this point are determined to be the least restrictive environment. Um, it does include community preschools, sometimes child care settings, Head Start programs, um, or even public library groups. So, um, the CBI community-based um, teachers will bring groups together with students um, so they have a peer group. And then they also do sometimes consider other options such as services in a classroom with other children who have disabilities or in a one-to-one -one setting. Um, we do have one community-based team leader, and we do have six community-based teachers and six community-based paraeducators. And those are the um, staff that we have that support all of our students who are receiving those services. So for Child Find, this kind of speaks to the referral process that we have. Child Find lives within birth to five. Um, it's a little misleading because it actually covers um, the referral process for students all the way up to 21. Um, we do have child find centers in Baltimore County Public Schools. So we do have four child find centers. So families like Dr. Um, sorry, Dr. Wood said alluded to, they can actually go to the child find center and there is a screening process that would occur there. And again, there's a multi-disciplinary multi, um, team of a special education teacher, an SLP, a PT, a psychologist, and a nurse. So they're really looking at it from a comprehensive lens and looking at the evaluation process comprehensively so they can meet the needs of the whole child. So for our youngest students, they would access the Child Finding Center. For some of our students who are school age, even if they call in for the screening um, and share a concern that they're having, they would go to the home school for um, the IEP team. So they would go to the home school when they are of school age. Um, we do, again, provide child find services for preschool children residing in Baltimore County who are not enrolled, and also students attending an MSD-approved private parochial school located in Baltimore County. And that is, um, even if they are the schools in Baltimore County and they're not a resident, we still provide the services because they're in a Baltimore County school. Um, Again, uh, service for eligibility are for not for Baltimore County residents are subject to the current, we have something called a notice of services, and that is located on our website. It's shared with all the private parochial schools, and it talks about how we provide services to our students um, who are not actually in a Baltimore County public school, but we've determined them eligible for a service plan. So we had the IFSP for our youngest ones, the IEP for school age, and then for students who are in a private parochial setting who are accessing services, that's what we would call a service plan. Um, so for child, yeah. The watershed school, is, would you just treat? Uh, that's like yeah. one of our schools. Mm -hmm. That's a public that's school. Just, just a regular school, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for child find, we do have four child find assessment centers. So we have four team leaders. And then we also have multiple staff, such as the psychologist, the speech and language pathologist, physical therapist, clerical staff, and some contractual members. 
And then the last part for our Birth of Five would be our early childhood programs. So we do offer um, preschool services and pre-K services here within Baltimore County. Some of our students are participating in our pre-K and preschool programs and they're receiving their services inside um, by a special education teacher who is consulting with or working collaboratively or sometimes even co-teaching with a pre-K teacher. Then we also have um, some self-contained options called outside gen ed threes and fours. So those are fully self-contained programs that we have. And then we have inside gen ed three-year-old and four-year-old programs where it's a mix of um, students with IEPs and typical peers. What we really try to do is work diligently with strategic planning and with the early childhood office to make sure that we're partnering and matching up those programs, our three and four special education programs with the uh, uh, general education pre-K. Mm -hmm. um, preschool and pre-K programs, so our students have those opportunities for, for inclusion as best we can. So for our school-based services, so we're looking at that whole continuum from that first flow chart. These are the acronyms that we use that are also aligned to how we allocate our staffing for the schools. So inside general ed, that's for students who are receiving more than 80% of their day um, inside the general education classroom. And for us in Baltimore County, so of that 15,313 number that was shared earlier, 8,802 students are receiving their services in LREA, which is about 65.3% total. That total number is slightly below a state target, but um, we are definitely receiving more students new to our county requiring LREB and LREC services. Within the LREB, we do have of that 15,313 number, 1,893, and that was our October count. It may not be it for right today, but that was what was reported. And that's about 14.04% of our special education population. And then um, LREB is for 40 to 79% of their day, they're accessing the general education classroom. That's mostly used as more of like a resource room model where students might come in to the, um, to the resource room and receive some services such as um, some um, services in regards to math or maybe maybe for um, social studies or whatever that is partly in the resource room and they're receiving most of their services inside the general education setting. And then for LREC, um, that is outside, so they're only inside for um, less than 40%. And that's more, more or less of like a self-contained setting. And we can offer that self-contained setting which we refer to as outside gen ed in any of our comprehensive schools in Baltimore County. Um, C, it's 10.97%, which was 1,479 students. So as you can see, as we go through the continuum, more of our students are receiving their services in the general education setting. So what does it look like um, for LREA in the general ed? It's primarily the general education teacher is primarily a service provider for our students. And the, gen the special education teacher would service consult. They would push in. Um, it looks very different from classroom to classroom, from school mm -hmm. to school, depending upon the needs of the students because it's driven around how the IP team clarifies what that should look like. Um, there's co-teaching models that are occurring in our classrooms. There's sometimes um, special education teachers in which we really push to have our reading specialists, I look to Mache, mm -hmm. to have them work as um, like almost co-providers because they're really working to meet the needs of um, literacy for all of their students. So how can they combine and maximize their resources and efforts? So in LREA, it's really a fluid model and it can change from anything from direct services to consult for our students. LREB is a little bit more of that resource room model where a special education teacher and maybe a reading specialist or a different or a resource teacher within the school building might um, provide those outside general education services that are more um, aligned to like an intervention type of program that can't be um, implemented within the classroom setting. And then LREC is a full special education teacher and usually a paraeducator who's also providing the services because it's determined by the team that the student's services and the IP can't be implemented or met in the least um, within the general education setting. I do want to point out within all of these LRA, B, and C that students with disabilities, they must have general and special education um, and they are required to still have those high expectations that must exist to prepare and ensure that all of our students are college career and also community ready. And it's making sure that um, for students with IEPs, the IEP is really serving as that kind of diagnostic prescriptive tool with what are the goals that we're identifying and what are those services that we're identifying 
to align to the student's current performance level so we can really give them access with outcomes and really narrow the gap for our students um, in the least restrictive environment. And you'll see here related services is kind of underneath because it seems infants and toddlers our related services um, also span throughout from all the way birth all the way up to 21. And the related services are also determined by the IP team. Services, as Ms. Townsend shared, I think before, they can be pushed into the classroom setting or we could offer pull out. It's really a decision that's made in the best interest of the student and that's individualized at that level. May I ask a question, sure. please? Mm -hmm. For the LREA students, when a parent is involved with a student's IEP, is the parent made aware of the fact that in that situation, most of the services are provided by a general educator? They are. The parent, oops, sorry, guys. Yeah, it's discussed at the IEP team and there's a section of the IEP where they discuss the hours of service and who is going to be the provider of that service. So there's different lines for instruction or counseling or speech and language and then it, there's like this drop down where they talk about, well, who's going to be the person who's going to deliver the service. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the parent hopefully is there because they are the required and we do um, value them as a member of the team they're required for uh, the IEP team but it is there is on each IEP a clarification of service delivery so every IEP does have that box there where they have to talk about the child's entire day and all the classes that they're going to have and who will be the service provider and how long um, those services will be provided for um, for our LRE, let's see, so for our teachers for that, we do have what we call the continuum teachers, LRE A, B, and C. We do have um, 719 special education teachers. And for the self-contained, we have 324. So of the 719, which is included in our staffing plan, 290.5 are um, special education elementary teachers. 200 are middle and 228.5 are high school special education teachers. And we really look at our special education teachers as um, experts in access. Um, they, especially at the um, secondary level, we really um, have them work collaboratively with the general education teachers and the department chair. So they are ensuring that the teachers are providing those opportunities for the accommodations, supplementary aids and services, and the access. We're, we do look at them as the access experts at the secondary level. Our early childhood teachers, we do have 50.5, um, which is totals 1,193.5 teachers total. And so, we, have, we, have, we know that we have shortages in the general education teacher pool, and I know it's a nationwide problem. Mm -hmm. Are we experiencing that with special educators also? Yes. Um, special education teachers are uh, overall are a critical shortage nationally. Um, so we do, as part of our staffing plan, we are required to work very closely with our Department of Human Resources in regards to the recruitment. And some of it is linked to how do we continually provide improved professional learning for our teachers so that way they have the necessary tools and are equipped with the necessary tools mm -hmm. to support our students in the classroom. So we're always looking at it kind of from a multi-layered approach. One of it is just supporting our teachers. Um, another part of it is helping them to manage their caseloads by having adequate ca um, class sizes and caseloads. And then there's another portion of it or a third prong of it, which is really around the recruitment and working with Department of Human Resources to make sure we're recruiting for our teachers. Um, and then the speech and language pathologists would be another critical shortage area. I'll just add, Ms. Mack, that many of the colleges and universities are um, structuring programs for uh, students who are entering education as a major to also have dual certification in special education. That's becoming um, more and more widespread so that they recognize nationally uh, we need the typical classroom teacher needs to be well prepared to support students in the general education setting who are also may have special needs. And so the universities are also uh, shifting some of their programming to help with that as well. Yeah, You're and welcome. that's really positive. I mean, that was a program that I was involved, the dual certificate program way back when even I was in college. But <laughs> um, I will say what's uh, a nice benefit to that is some of my classmates and many people go into general education and having that special education certificate and background as well is a real benefit to all the children and really um, helps the teacher sustain the fact that many students with special education needs and IEPs are in general ed classrooms. So. 
just one last comment, just since we're on that, because I want to make sure you do have a full understanding. Even secondary teachers, um, for myself, who was a social studies uh, teacher, I too had to take a certain number of special education classes just for general certification purposes, regardless of your certification area. Now, certainly, uh, your content uh, certified teachers at the secondary level don't have the level of special education uh, cr credentials that a certified special educator does, but all educators do have at least some coursework to get their professional license. Mm -hmm. And the requirement for special the self-contained special education teachers at the secondary level would be that they have the content and the special education mm -hmm. um, certification to be able to teach a self-contained class in that content area in secondary. Mm -hmm. For our um, school-based services that we have, so for our related services, we do have 161.1 speech and language pathologists, and that's outlined in our staffing plan, and that's how many um, FTE that we will have for SLPs next school year. And then we also, as you're aware, we do have to work um, to provide contracted services, and that's 12.1 um, that we do have contractual providers. And then we have OT. We do have 53 occupational therapists, and that will be our staffing for next school year. And we do have 5.6, which are contractual providers. We have 18 physical therapists within Baltimore County Schools and 0.4 contracted um, providers. We spoke last time about the DHH services and about the programming. We do have 8.2 DHH itinerant teachers. And then we also have teachers of the visually impaired to support our students, um, and we have seven of those. So those are all of our school-based services that we um, provide. And then on the next part of the continuum, so when an IEP team um, reviews a child's current levels and they have determined that they require more services, um, then we do offer regional options here within Baltimore County Public Schools. Ideally, we'd love to offer this in all of our schools, but with a system this size, we really do have to concentrate our staffing and our supports and our resources um, so that we can maximize our resources overall. We do have functional academic learning support programs, and you might hear the acronym FOWLS being used by lots of teachers. It's really functional academic learning support. We have communication learning support programs, social emotional learning support programs, social communication learning support programs, and then we also have the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, for our students who are accessing the services of social emotional learning support program, it's basically students who are in need of primarily those social emotional services and those that are experiencing more significant or some complex social emotional um, difficulties and it's adversely impacting their ability to be successful in the general education setting or even kind of in the next setting where we talked about are they going to be uh, receiving their services in more of a resource room model or we can we provide them an outside gen ed. We would like to try to exhaust or utilize all resources within the home school first before we would look at um, an option outside of the home school. Um, many of these at the elementary level, um, we have these regionalized and so within each of our geographic areas, the old traditional Northwest, Northeast, Southwest, Southeast, and Central, we do have at least two options in most of our, in most of our um, geographic areas. We've had to expand over the years because we are um, increasing overall, and we're actually receiving a lot of students who are new to county requiring that level of support and service. So we wanna make sure that we have adequate class sizes. For our social, um, Emotional learning programs, the ratio that we use, and it's a recommended ratio, is nine to one. So for nine students, there would be one teacher and one paraeducator. Um, in many of our cases, in the elementary schools, we have about two, or next year we'll have three teachers total. So they will have multi multiple grade levels, and it's really going to vary in each school depending upon the number of students that you have there. So there's some flexibility within their staffing and how they provide their services. Um, the services offered for our SAL programs, it is that lower teacher um, to student ratio. It's a highly structured learning environment um, that is really focused on behavior management systems, those social skills that's a, that are integrated throughout their entire day. Um, we're also looking at conflict resolution, restorative practices, and then they would also have increased services. That's where we would work with um, the, Depar the Department of Climate and the ser services that they would provide, such as the psychological services or the social work services, we would see more likely increased 
um, related services in the SEL program, such as the social work and the so and school psychologists are two main resources that we have. Within the um, SEL program, that goes all the way from next year kindergarten all the way up to, to grade 12. For our, um, we'll go to the next one, social communication learning support program, these are also students who are diploma bound um, in our SEL and SCLS program. Our SCLS program, we've had primarily at our secondary level um, at We've had it in the central area, we've had it in the southeast area we added to, and in um, also the northwest area. So we're actually expanding that. We're excited that each geographic area will have um, this program over time because we want to ensure that we are providing services that are closest as possible to the student's home school. Um, and then we also want to ensure that we're minimizing ride times. We work very closely with the Office of Transportation, the Office of Law, Strategic Planning and Facilities, and really identifying the most appropriate sites. It's a pretty comprehensive process that we go through to ensure that we are meeting the students' needs. So, go ahead. Could, could <coughs> flow between a general education setting and like an SEL setting um, and then back it they could, po yeah, they it could can. possibly. So all these that she's talking about are still within a, like a neighborhood school or a comprehensive school. So they could be, this is like the LREC she was talking about. So they could be out for more than, would you say 60% or 30% of the time. But when they're in the general ed, they may be participating say in like a PE class or a biology class or something like that. So they could, depending on what their IEP says, they could be flowing in and out as long as it's less time than what is required to be an LREC. And then some of right. our students also then, mm -hmm. if it's not their home school, we have had some cases where students have been very successful and through the IEP team process and they have actually had their services continued um, at their home school as well. Mm -hmm. For the social communication learning support, these are for students who are mostly high functioning autism and their primary areas of need would be around the pragmatics, the communication skills, but it's really around the social types of communication skills. Um, so for these, our programs too, these are for students who are diploma bound, who are high functioning autism, and we work very closely um, with the SLPs and also with the psychologists and the counselors to make sure that we have a comprehensive set of services for our students within these programs. These are also, again, regionally based throughout the county, the geographic areas, and we will have some of the elementary sites um, next school year. But for a while, we've only had one, one program at the elementary level, so we'll have that at all of our geographic areas, so that way we can have more students accessing this because we do see autism coming up as a huge need. And sometimes some of our students, um, not only do they have the social communication support, but they also have the social emotional needs too. Many of our students with high functioning autism do very well in our inclusive settings. Um, sometimes some of them might need to come out a little bit for some support outside of the general education classroom because sometimes it could be overstimulating for them at times. But we do have a set of our population that we want to provide comparable services within our our county and that's why we want to offer a regional option that is more of a self-contained option for students who require that more intensive level of supports and services. We also have the um, communication learning support. So this one is for students who um, IEPs are mostly around the communication skills and many of our students, not all of them, are um, morely, uh, more participating on the certificate track when compared to the diploma track that was uh, the high functioning autism that I just spoke to earlier. Within this classroom, it's very highly structured. This is also a nine to one ratio as well and it was for the other one too. So they have nine um, students at the most. We would also have a teacher and a paraeducator and usually there's some additional adult support staff that would work within the classroom setting. It's all about providing that structured learning environment that has huge emphasis on just those visuals and then also heavily, um, heavily um, prevalent you will see the communication needs as well. Some of our students will be nonverbal in these classrooms. We want to provide those communication devices but not all of our students are nonverbal. So even within these uh, this programs I'm talking about, we still even kind of almost see a continuum of services as well within each of these classrooms because none of our students are exactly the same and their profiles are very unique. So there is a lot of personalization within these classrooms too. While there's structures that are very similar, we want to make sure that we're customizing and personalizing it to the needs of the students. 
the CLS, we had that um, as an option for some of our three-year-olds and four-year-olds. When I was talking about the outside gen ed, a lot of our students um, might have a coding of developmental delay, or they might even have an autism coding at that time, do access those OGE threes and fours classrooms, and then they would participate um, in K um, all the way up until 21 years of age in the Cal's classrooms. And for our functional academic learning support programs, these are students who demonstrate delays in measured intelligence, their um, cognitive levels, and adaptive functioning. And again, these are team decisions that are made. Many of our students also are working on addressing more of those real world application skills or life skills that we'll call them to ensure that they are not only successful in school, but we want to make sure that they are applying these skills to the community because we want to ensure that all of our students are college career and also community ready. For this particular programming, we do offer it from um, kindergarten all the way up to 21. And a lot of our students in the middle schools and high schools, most of our middle schools and high schools do offer this at the home school. There's very few middle and high schools that do not offer the functional academic learning support models. Most of our students um, are able to stay in their home schools. We also do offer five um, sites that are on camp college campuses. So we have sites at Owings Mill CCBC, we have Dundalk Community College site, Essex site, Owings, Owings Mills, Catonsville, Dundalk, Essex, Towson. and then Towson University. <laughs> so we do have um, students who are accessing um, the college life, if you will, and they're able to participate in some of the classes there. So we do offer five, five locations for students um, who are usually from 18 to, to 21, so for a few years there. So that was our fouls. And then the last one that we would offer would be the DHH, and we spoke a little bit about that last time. Most of our students who do have the hearing impairment um, are receiving their services in their home school. We do, though, offer a regional model for students who require the more intensive level, and we do have one um, elementary, middle, and high school program that is um, a disability coding where we have less number of students, so we are able to uh, service that through one at the elementary, one at middle, and one at high, when compared to the others where that's in each regional model. So then we're moving down the continuum to the next part. So we want to ensure that all of our students' needs are met here within our comprehensive schools, um, within that LREA, the inclusion, the resource room model, and then we would try a regional program. If our students' needs cannot be met, in the regional program within our comprehensive schools, then we would look to something that would be even more restrictive, which would be our separate public day school options here, and we have four of those in um, Baltimore County. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about White Oak School as the former principal there. Um, it's different than the three other special schools. It's elementary only age students, and a majority of them are diploma bound. So it's um, a school that runs mostly the SEL, that social emotional learning support program. It does have um, a few classes of students that are the communication and learning support class that are the certificate group, um, but the, the whole school is designed around serving students that have challenging behaviors that come through the IEP team process. So um, there, I, I want to mention that all three schools have a very small population of students. We're talking about less than 1% of our special ed populations are served among these four schools. Um, you know, so the, the amount of students range in the around 100, maybe less than 100, maybe a little more than 100 students entire building, the staff ratio is a little bit lower than what she had quoted for the regional programs. Seven Do you have? Five, it's <laughs> 7.5 to 1. And it's actually 2.4% of our total school population, so it's still a small percentage. Um, and uh, so the so White Oak School is a little more unique than the other special schools. We have Mr. Easterly here to share. He's from Battle Monument, but Battle Monument, Maiden Choice, and Ridge Ruxton School um, have a more similar program. The beauty of White Oak School being right across the street from Oakley Elementary, as um, Ms. Ryder was saying, we're always looking at opportunities where we can include children. So when we saw students that were having success with their academics and behaviors, we were um, using staff members to walk uh, across the street and be included in some opportunities there. And then we knew better if um, that was a student that could return back to possibly like a regional program in a comprehensive school um, and then continue to 
be included over time um, if that was appropriate for them. So there is still an option um, at the sub separate public day schools to um, see if inclusion opportunities are more appropriate. There's a, another distinguishing factor with um, mostly the students in the FALS and CALS programs that we're working on are diploma bound as well. And you're going to see that really um, done very well in our separate public day schools as community-based services. When I talked about our youngest learners, we were talking about community-based instruction where they're receiving that teaching in their natural environment. We do work very closely with our programs and our administrators to provide community-based instruction. And those are services that we provide to our students in the community. Um, so they're really applying what they've learned in the classroom setting, whether it's at um, different job sites. We also offer that. Um, they also will go into stores, into um, any, any type of public setting, so that way they have an opportunity to really apply the skills that are learned. And that's what we call community-based instruction. And I have to say thank you so much to the Office of Transportation because they work very closely with us <laughs> to provide those services as best they can. Ms. Ryder. Go ahead. <clears throat> um, interestingly enough, my youngest daughter, who was born in 1989, was part of a program. She's typically developing child. Well, actually, she's a woman, but <laughs> at the time. Um, and she actually attended school at Maiden Choice. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it was, if her, I don't really remember. How, I know we had to approve it, sure. and it was a wonderful experience for her. Do we do that anymore? So I, so I believe, yes, Maiden Choice still has, a, it, it's a preschool program, right? It was like a, when she was three or four years old, probably. I think it was second grade. Oh. So I can say currently there is a preschool pre-K um, Kind of inclusion option at Maiden Choice School. I'll have mm -hmm. to go back and look, sure. but I mean, it was a great it. year for her, mm -hmm. and I was just mm -hmm. wondering. Um, With our separate public day schools, what um, makes them um, unique or most restrictive is because there are less options. They are being instructed with. Um, with only students with IEPs and not with our non-disabled peers. So that would be like the most restrictive setting that we would offer in our county. But knowing that, we do work very diligently with the neighboring schools to make sure we can provide those inclusive opportunities for our students. Mm -hmm. Mr. Easley, you can talk yeah, about that. Can. So <laughs> the um, other three special schools are very different than White Oak. Mm -hmm. All of the students are targeted to receive a certificate of attendance. Um, the students range in age from three to 21. They all have significant intellectual disabilities. Um, many of them have other handicapping conditions as well, physical disabilities, medical disabilities, um, different syndromes, um, which impact the child's ability to access their educational program. Um, we have a combination, sort of a, a mish, of students that require intensive assistance with personal care needs, have um, underdeveloped communication systems. We also have students that require extensive behavioral support needs. Um, and many of the students fall in somewhere in between that continuum, um, needing behavioral supports, but also requiring assistance with managing um, personal care skills. Um, we do have provide community-based instruction. Um, all of the classes go out into the community to practice the skills we're working on. Uh, the three special schools also have a transition coordinator through the county that we work with to look at how are we preparing these students for life after 21 when they leave the education system. Um, we also provide some job training opportunities where the transition facilitator um, or school staff or conjunction of both will find um, work sites in the neighborhood community and then students can actually go practice work skills and that could become a precursor to um, options which may be available after they turn 21. Um, the ma majority of the students when they turn 21 go into a um, day program or medical day program. Um, we are starting to see students that are academically more independent but require those behavioral support needs. And so again, um, they may have more options um, when they get older. Um, we always want to prepare students to transition to a less restrictive setting. Mm -hmm. um, th that's all of the th three principal's goals. Mm -hmm. um, 
if a student is not successful um, in the public separate day school setting, then they would go into what's called non-public placement. And I think you're going to talk about that. We Thank are. You. And you just had a student who received a job recently, right? Yes, we have a student who um, came from a different state um, who's very independent. Um, we actually reteamed him, and he's going to go back into a comprehensive school. But one of the work sites, uh, Red Brick Station in White Marsh, he has gone to, and they have actually offered him a paying job. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's career readiness. Yeah. Um, so in addition to the separate public day, so that's the most restrictive service option that we have here within Baltimore County. We also offer um, some other additional services, if you will. If a child's needs could not be met here within Baltimore County, then we would look at a non-public site. Um, most of those would be a team decision. Sometimes they're also through dispute resolution as well. And we do have, at that time, 649 students, which is 4.81% of our population. Um, we are always looking to see um, how we can provide or offer those comparable services here within our county. It is our goal to service all of our students here within the county. Um, but we do realize that for some of our students, they do need uh, the services that can be provided in a non-public setting. Um, we do have case managers in our office. So we have three who are also case managing. And because we still have to hold all the IEP teams, they're still our Baltimore County students, even though they're in a non-public setting. So we still offer transportation. And then we also um, hold the IEP teams for the students. And then we also still work with a lot with the families as well. And that was for all 649 of those students. For the alternative schools, for students who are receiving their instruction right now at the alternative schools at the secondary level, we are still um, obligated to provide FAPE and services. So they also have special education staffing at their schools, so that way the services are not interrupted for the students. We also have private parochial, which we talked about a little bit earlier. If a, a child is receiving their services in a private parochial school, they can still come to have a team held in a Baltimore County Public School. And then we were also we can also provide services as outlined in our notice of service plan. Um, for many of the many of our students, most of the services are for speech and language. And we had um, 268 students, which was 1.99% of them receiving service plans. Um, in Baltimore County, and we had 12 SLPs um, that are providing services to students in the private parochial settings and 10.4 contractual SLPs. We do also offer services for students who are being housed in the Baltimore County Detention Center. Um, we also have to provide special education teachers to ensure that their education is not interrupted in that setting, and that as of last week or so is 11 students who are still providing that level of service too. So the services kind of links overall to where does all of this live and where can you find all these numbers that we were just talking about very <laughs> easily. Um, they are actually located on the BCPS website. So on the Office of Special Education website, every year we have the staffing plan is, that is there. It's there for the public to review. And the staffing plan, we have to develop that every single year. And you'll see that a lot of that is included when the budget is approved in January. On the budget book page, there's the special education staffing. And the whole assurance of the special education staffing plan is to say that we here at Baltimore County Public Schools are assuring a free, appropriate public education for all of our students. That's the main purpose of the plan overall. In accordance with the plan, there are components of the staffing plan that we must include. Um, we have to have the insurance of FAPE. We have to have an introduction, which aligns to our blueprint um, 2.0. We have to include a section on a staffing plan review, how we're continually in a state of analysis and examination of our previous staffing plan, and where can we make improvements for the upcoming staffing plan. We have to show evidence of public input. We also have to demonstrate and understand um, the staffing patterns that we've seen. We have to allude to any um, vacancies that we might have or where we might see critical shortages. That's noted within the staffing plan and the methods that we use and then the total number overall of providers. That's actually all embedded and online. The whole point of it, again, is to show the alignment between the Blueprint 2.0 here in Baltimore County and how does that align with the Individuals with Disabilities Act and the insurance of FAPE. Just a few highlights um, from our staffing plan review from last time. We're very 
proud and we are very thankful that we did receive additional infants and toddlers teachers. So we thank you, the board, for approving that in our budget. We received four. As um, I discussed earlier, we are increasing rapidly and within our infants and toddlers program and we want to make sure that we have adequate case loads for our teachers so that we can retain our teachers. Um, so we did receive four infants and toddlers teachers. We did receive additional special education teachers um, within the last budget, related service providers a few years ago we received, transition facilitators as um, Mr. Easterly alluded to. We do have, I think off the top of my head, about 14 of those and they work um, with, at the secondary level for students who are ages 14 through 21 for all students with IEPs and they are working with the case managers in the school to develop transition activities so that way we're ensuring our students are ready for post-secondary success and their college career or community ready. We did receive um, BCBAs, which we love having our BCBAs mm -hmm. on board. I was working with a few of them in a school today um, and really helping us to design some behavior plans for some individual students. So for some strengths overall when we analyze this, there is um, a work group. We have a staffing plan work group that includes um, CCAC. It also includes staff within BCPS and includes a lot of um, administrators as well and human resources. Strengths overall, we did see an improved analysis of staffing by using just an assessment of multiple data sources in grades preschool to 12, and then also increased staffing to support special education enrollment growth um, because we're continually growing faster um, than we can um, have the actual teachers. So we were seeing some increases there. And then our whole goal as shared in the budget request was also to increase the continuum of services for our elementary. When students are receiving those outside gen ed services, we wanna make sure that they can access them in their home school first before we would look at something more restrictive. So we're always looking at ways in which we can build up the staffing at the elementary level to offer that true continuum within their home school. We also um, have improved programmatic options to ensure that we are providing options within each of the geographic areas. So we have a multi-year plan to make sure that all of our geographic areas are covered to ensure students are receiving their services closest to their home school and minimizing the ride times for our students. And then just the um, improved intercollaborative processes. We work very closely throughout the year with transportation and strategic planning and facilities and the Office of Law and Human Resources to develop our staffing plan. And part of it also is really um, including a line strategic professional learning plan to make sure that our professional learning is aligned to where our needs are of our, of our teachers and of our students. So again, the needs overall from our plan was just to look at the continued um, requests for ensuring continuum of services for LREC at the elementary level, um, expanding our existing regional options in each geographic area over time, and then content, um, continually reviewing the recommended ratios. That's something of which came up through a lot of feedback was can we look at our ratios again to ensure that we have adequate class sizes. Um, it's always a request to have IEP chairpersons at the elementary and secondary level that always comes up as an area of request and need for us through our feedback from our stakeholder groups. Um, reviewing the ratios for paraeducators and then um, continually looking to find out how we can ensure adequate caseloads for related services and continuing to increase for transition facilitators. We're so grateful to have 14, but 14 isn't always enough for all of the needs of our students. Okay. We do receive stakeholder input um, throughout the year. We've already received input as we've developed our plan for next year. We're already starting with the following, um, with the upcoming school year. So the interesting part is that 15,313 count was this October and the staffing plan and the staffing that's allocated is for next school year. So it's for the 1920 school year. Um, we work very closely again to the Office of Communications. They provide all of the um, different notifications about the public hearings, the meetings, and the workshops. That's also included in the staffing plan just to show the whole budget process and how we allocate the teachers and how that's approved. And then we work very closely with our special education citizens advisory group and then also with the Disabilities Awareness Commission and continually sharing where we are with our staffing, where our needs are, and to get their input and feedback with where we can improve from the staffing perspective. Um, they also at CCAC share once a year their recommendations about how to um, continually address staffing needs. Um, each December, they did share that with um, Intern Superintendent Ms. White, and I believe a copy as were shared with, with the board following that meeting. Um, so for staffing patterns, we have to continually assess within our office um, the, the, the patterns that we have that. Where do we see growth? 
we're constantly working with also DRA is another group we're working very closely with, with where can we also not note where we're seeing growth, but how can we also better anticipate where the growth will be coming? Um, because there's sometimes with the Newton County, um, there's sometimes there's sometimes there's an unanticipated growth that we've seen. For example, it was last school year we did see a pocket of increased growth in the southwest for students coming in requiring our CALS program, and then we had to shift our staffing accordingly at the onset of the school year. So it's not ideal to make that shift, but we want to ensure that we have those adequate class sizes. So we always make sure that we can make those adjustments as necessary if the growth increases throughout the school year. Um, we also have to look very closely at the related services, so the staffing does go out to principals in December, or I'm sorry, we work on it with the December number. So even though there's the October number that is captured, that's provided to MSD, we actually utilize the December number because it gets us closer to where we need to be. And then we, we are looking at this actually on a weekly basis mm -hmm. within, our, within our office. Mm -hmm. We look at staffing very closely to make sure that we have um, appropriately allocated. Right now, we're doing what's called progressions. So that is where students are moving from one school to another, um, from fifth to sixth grade, or eighth grade to ninth, or some, some cases from K to one. So we are looking to see where we would anticipate their needs would be met in the type of program or LRE for next year, and then we'll make the necessary adjustments in June once progressions are finished, and if anything is approved, hopefully through the budget, we would readjust allocations for teachers and for paraeducators as appropriate. Um, and then throughout the year, we would work very closely with the administrators at the school level to constantly examine schedules um, and caseloads of teachers for any other necessary changes that would have to occur. We also work very closely, as I share, with the Department of Human Resources with the recruitment. Some of our staff actually do go out on a recruitment fairs, and um, um, they have to go out to, to lots of different colleges. Um, we also work very closely with the Office of Organizational Development on just the partnerships that we have with the local colleges within the, within the schools. Um, we also have to include within the staffing plan professional learning. And we are, this is something we've worked very close to because our staffing plan, where our needs are from a staffing perspective, also need to be aligned to where and how we are utilizing our, our professional learning to constantly build the capacity of our teachers. And it kind of goes back to that question you asked earlier. One, the, one of the best ways to retain the teachers is making sure that they have high quality training and that we are providing them with the necessary supports that they need so that they can effectively um, they can effectively case manage, they can effectively write high quality IPs, and they can also effectively implement the services on an IEP. For professional learning, we work very closely with the other offices to provide a strategic planning. We don't look at it as an office of special ed plan because as you can see, most of our students are serviced within the general education setting, so we have to work very closely with the content offices. And I know you've heard several times about our close relationship with the Office of English Language Arts and how are we always um, aligning our funds and how are we having a strategic plan overall for all of our teachers, general ed and our special education teachers. We also work um, annually to assess our plan and we're already on to planning and getting feedback from all of our multiple, um, from the administrators, from teachers, from IEP chairpersons, from parents. We've received lots of different feedback and we're continually examining our current staffing plan and then we will revise that for the following school year based upon feedback and then also based upon just information that we've gained from just constantly analyzing just a variety of of data sources to ensure that we are providing faith and <coughs> providing adequate class sizes for our students. Do you, do you want to take us to take questions before the video? Do you want us to show the video? Yeah. Could I mention I'm actually, I'm going to ask oh. that we hold on the video because of time, okay. and we can send the link to everyone. Um, and the video highlights uh, some of our special education services. I'm sorry to have to ask that. Okay. However, do I it. do would like to open it up for um, questions, and just so that we're all cognizant of time, it's um, about ten after five, and I know our board members need to. They have a boundary meeting uh, later, so I need to make sure that we stay close to our schedule today. So if I could mention, just mention the staffing in the three public uh, separate day schools, Ridge Direction, the Maiden Choice, and Battle Monument, um, in addition to the ratios being a little bit low, lower, um, all of the classes have a teacher, a paraeducator, and at least one additional adult assistant. If you really look at um, the numbers, the additional adult assistants make up the majority of our staffing because of the intensive needs of the students mm -hmm. and that's also an area where um, there's 
we cannot get fully staffed with those positions. It's a critical area um, as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So any questions that you may have for our special education team? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I, I will just put a plug in. Our special schools are having graduation ceremonies uh, <laughs> next week. They are beautiful opportunities. They are, are at the very beginning of the graduation ceremonies, and I would invite you and encourage you to attend. They um, are beautiful opportunities to, to see these schools, our teachers, our principals, and the parents uh, in a truly joyful moment of their life. So, yes. I just want to thank you. That was really um very, very, very thorough. But there, you're doing a wonderful job. A lot of things um, going on in the system and in our um, comprehensive schools as well. And having come out of one that um, had a couple of programs, I always appreciated it. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Before we move forward, I'd like to introduce um, John Offerman, who has graciously agreed to join the curriculum committee. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Offerman is a member at large who, whose experience as both a teacher and a guidance counselor lends um, itself well to this committee. So welcome, John. Thank you, and I apologize for being late today. I had a, a medical uh, issue. Uh, uh, certainly, this is an imp a very important group, and uh, I'd like to, you know, I like to think I can, I can, I can help based on my experience. But of course, a lot of things are, as in all of UCS, changing at such a rapid rate. So uh, I appreciate the efforts that everybody's doing, and I'm, I'm glad to be part of the group. Thank you. Okay, so um, moving on, at this point, we're going to bring forward instructional materials that um, we'd like to present to the curriculum committee uh, for approval. And um, at that, we'll jump right in uh, to an ESOL resource. And Dr. Sure. Wilson, Aaron um, Sullivan. Yeah, Ms. Uh, Dr. Sullivan here is going to uh, lead this presentation, but I just wanted to share that this sheltered instruction observation protocol is in fact a, a professional learning that we do with staff. So teachers get this professional learning as um, a way to better inform their instructional practices with students. So it's not actual materials that the students are using, but that teach. it's a resource for teachers. So, Dr. Sullivan. Okay, um, so this is a um, initiative that we started in BCPS in 2015. And so just to explain what PSYOP is a little bit, it's an instructional model that's designed for content teachers to make content more accessible for English learners. So it's really not for ESOL teachers, it's for the c content teachers. It's a research-based um, method that has been proven effective to move students in English learners in academic achievement. Um, there are eight components um, and 30 features, but two components that I just will highlight quickly are interaction, um, and comprehensible input. So for interaction, it's very important that the teachers have tools to make sure that they are giving students m greater opportunities to interact in reading, writing, listening, and speaking with their native uh, English peers. Um, sometimes that can be really difficult. Teachers don't know how to navigate that, and so SIOP really helps with that. So in that way, children are getting access to the content, but they're also getting um, practice with the language, which is imperative for their language development. Um, and then the second piece is the comprehensible input. When we talk about comprehensible input, we're talking about ways to make the content more accessible to English learners. A couple um, examples of how you can do that is one, increased visuals in the classroom, as well as making sure that they're using uh, materials that are tied to, that are culturally appropriate for students and tied to their cultural backgrounds. So that's just two ways to make the content more accessible. Okay, so many of you have seen this visual before. Um, this is our ESOL dashboard, but I wanted to talk about why PSYOP, and so there are three numbers in particular that I'm going to um, try to highlight here. The first is our current number. So um, as of today, we're a little bit over this, but th at the time of this was 8,205 students. What's really important to know is that um, the 
most ESOL students, the majority of the day are in content or classroom teacher, are in classes with content or classroom teachers, who, unlike special education, mm -hmm. are not required to take any coursework in their mm -hmm. teacher education program to know how to service the students. So it becomes really imperative that we're teaching that as a system, we're providing professional learning to these teachers. Um, the other number is the number from October 31st. So you can see there's been a, a jump of almost 600 students since that time. Also during that time, we don't get additional staffing. So making sure again that our classroom teachers are prepared for the students that will arrive throughout the year. And the last number is the number of reclassified English learners. So these are the students who have exited the ESOL program. They've met with proficiency, met the number, um, the target number in the past two years. But the target number to, to exit is 4.5. Um, six is fully proficient. So there's still um, a need for additional services. And so it's really important for teachers of reclassified English learners to also know how to support the language development. Mm -hmm. Um, so SIAP and BCPS, I mentioned that we started in 2015. Since that time, we've been able to train teachers at nine secondary centers. Currently, we are still providing ESOL services at five high schools and four middle schools. And so all of those centers have been, have had staff members and administrator, teachers and administrators trained in SIAP. We've also identified the top 15 elementary schools, meaning the most, with the most, the greatest population of English learners. Um, and we've been able to uh, train staff and teachers and administrators at those schools as well. We've also trained all of the ESOL teachers. So I mentioned earlier that this isn't really the program for ESOL teachers, it's for the content and the classroom teacher, but it's really important that ESOL teachers understand so that they can support the classroom teachers. So we've trained all of the ESOL teachers as well, as well as members of various academic offices. Um, so uh, resource teachers from the math office, the science office, social studies, um, really all the offices have been invited to the trainings as well. Um, the two types of professional development we offer, have offered thus far are 20 hour introductory course um, and that, that's where over 300 teachers have been trained in that course and then we then select um, teachers who are perhaps using it a little bit better to then uh, do the 20 hour SIOP coaching course and we've, to date, we've trained about 20 teachers in the SIOP coaching. Okay, so what's next? Mm -hmm. So what's next is we're, we, in order to be able, in order to reach more teachers, we wanna move from face-to-face -to, -face to a blended approach. So face-to-face, -face, we have been able to get 300 teachers trained, but we believe through a blended introductory training, we'll be able to reach more teachers um, in a more affordable way as well. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we're continuing to do that on a large scale, really targeting schools that may need that support. We also, at the secondary level, want to provide greater support through, pr through training of additional coaches so that we make sure that we're sustaining that training um, and that SIOP is really being embedded. And we have some good examples in the county of where schools are really have taken it on. Sudbrook Middle is an example where all of the teachers in all of the classes are doing SIOP strategies. Um, and so we, we're trying to move more towards that. Um, and also, we're going to utilize Schoology more from the district level to be able to provide support to the schools, as well as let the schools collaborate among, among, amongst each other. That's it. Okay. So um, <laughs> I'll, I'll let yeah. you have ask your questions, and then we'll question. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. I just have one question, and I'm not sure if I missed it. How is the effectiveness of SIOP measured with, and is it through feedback? So feedback it's or? Center of Applied Linguistics has done large scale studies to show that students who are um, in classrooms with SIOP trained teachers have had greater gains in academic measures. So assessments and that kind of thing. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that report. I actually was at Sudbrook mm -hmm. this morning and spent a lot of time with the um, ESOL mm -hmm. chair and asked a lot of questions uh, because my concern um, is, and I, I realize that uh, Sudbrook is a center, so it has, what, like 
tw it's a large 210. Two, 200 right I have it in my little book it has an awful lot of students and um, I ran into um, a number of them today one in particular because I was standing against her locker and she wanted me to move <laughs> and <laughs> she was trying to figure out how to make that happen and I just kept smiling and going, mm -hmm. uh, but my concern um, is just the, um, uh, I want to call it separation anxiety, uh, and especially when you're at a center like Sudbrook, um, and going back because the students are n not able to go to the home school, and then they go to, Sud go to a center, and they get all kinds of support. And in addition to the support that they get, they also make new friends who might not go to, be going back to um, that home school. So now they have, they're, they're separated. And so we talked about um, PSYOP as, as a matter of fact, and I think it is wonderful. I'd just like to see more folks be able to participate in that because it is so critical. And I watched in my own schools just the angst that children had when they came back because in the old, old days here, you know, you had little pockets and then you had the folks who, the itinerant folks who moved around to the schools to offer that support. And it, I guess it had its pros and cons, but the, the one thing is that the students were in a place where they were nurtured. I don't want to see the centers. I know that sometimes there's that conversation about the centers disappearing. Um, it, it's, I, I do think that it is something that we need to, about which we need to spend far more time, especially when we're talking about um, uh, supporting our, our students as they're coming and going. And I do think because we have far more numbers uh, than we did Ever. when I started, right. and they're happening every day. So like you just gave that number. <laughs> but while I was standing there today, there were two parents who were in. Oh, so that yeah. number changed while I was standing there. Mm -hmm. So we need, and, and, and there's the, that we need to promote a different um, relationship for our teachers, just like we do for special education, where teachers, as part of certification, have to have that special education course. We need to have something of that ilk, I believe, um, but I'm a peon. But that's what I believe for our teachers in terms of um, ESOL. Mm -hmm. At the state level, we have been advocating for that change, um, but it hasn't happened. So a lot, I will say a lot of schools, Notre Dame, um, St. Mary's University, they're starting to implement that without the MSD recommendation. They're just doing it on their own, but it's certainly not universal yet. Mm -hmm. I did just, Ms. Mack, I wanted to make sure that we were being supportive. Um, this, the pricing on this is is training per, per professional. Mm -hmm. So it's not a per pupil allocation, mm -hmm. but it's a per person who gets trained. Yes. Because PSYOP is a trademarked uh, strategy. True. Mm -hmm. yes. okay. okay. Just so, so you have a sense of how that model, the pricing on that is. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Ms. Shea, and uh, Ms. Shea, I think you're covering the CTE. Materials. I knew time was tight this evening, so I, I added the CTE right at the front of the science, so <laughs> so that we could roll right in. So this first part is um, an upcoming contract that will be coming this way for instructional applies for technology education. Um, and essentially, this is because we have a um, 
the background is we had a contract in place that covered um, the purchase of the materials that our CTE students need in tech ed classes for participating and completing their projects. Um, these are materials um, that they use as part of their design process um, in those courses. And the vendor that had been um, awarded the previous contract went out of business. So it was nearing expiration and the vendor went out of business, so we rebid. So I just give you that background as to why the contract is coming. The way that it is. Um, so it essentially provides for the curricular materials that we need for both the high school tech ed graduation required courses and some of the advanced technology ed completer courses, as well as some of the CTE courses in our middle school programs. So these are materials such as gears, motors, balsa wood, um, some blades, some circuitry supplies. Um, I was talking with Dr. Grubbs and Mr. Handy and saying things like doodads and <laughs> what's it? It's, it's all of the uh, materials that they would use to support their programming. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay, so moving right along, we're going to um, Ms. Schumacher, the Director of the Office of Science, is here with me today. Um, we are here, we're going to be bringing forward a contract soon for um, new textbooks for support of our next generation science standard integrated physics and chemistry class. So I'm going to very briefly, because I know we're short on time, talk a little bit about the next generation science standards. So um, several years ago, Maryland adopted the next generation science standards. And as we've talked about in this committee, oftentimes new standards means we have to revise curriculum and then have to uh, procure new resources. Um, so this graphic really illustrates a very general overview of how the next generation science standards approach the teaching of science differently. Um, and they really, the emphasis around the next generation science standards was on this concept of integration and about teaching scientific thinking. We know that science and technology are changing rapidly and we want to um, teach our students to be the problem solvers of the next generation. So those three bands represent this idea of um, the integration of these three disciplines. So in the orange, you'll see core ideas. That's known as the disciplinary core ideas or what we previously would think of as content. And so the core ideas in the next generation science standards represent um, life science, earth um, science and environmental science, as well as physical sciences, which includes both physics and chemistry. And then the fourth core is um, engineering. And then we also have um, in blue the practices. So these eight practices are those that are across and really teach scientific thinking. Um, it's really where we see scientific literacy. So the practices include things like asking questions, using models, developing reasoning. So if you think about some of the science and sciences and engineering, these would apply across the contents um, and are really how we build and develop scientific thinkers or scientifically literate students. And then the cross-cutting concepts, this is the idea of those concepts that are true no matter the content. And so these are things like cause and effect. So the concept or the cross-cutting idea of cause and effect would show up in a chemistry class. It would show up in a physical science class. Um, it could show up just as easily in um, the idea of the metamorphic rock cycle <laughs> as it could in a life cycle. Um, and so in particular, when we think about this idea of next generation science standards, we're really trying to help our students understand that science in the real world. So when you think about industries such as medicine, we know that it's not compartmentalized. Um, doctors need to understand um, the physical systems in the body as well as understanding the circular system, the respiratory system, and how those interact with each other, how they interact with the environmental factors. Um, and, and so we're teaching children that science cuts across with engineering practices. So because of this new design, um, one of the courses that was developed by our curricular offices um, is called Integrated Physics and Chemistry because, again, Comar outlines that students have to take courses in each of those disciplines ideas, um, and the physical sciences, as outlined in Next Generation, combines physics and chemistry. Um, most of our teachers are trained as physics 
or chemistry, even though their certification actually allows them for both. And so as we rolled out these pilot courses, our te we heard loud and clear from our teachers that they needed resources to support them. Um, specifically, they needed print resources to help support disciplinary literacy and how we teach scientific thinking through reading and writing and listening and speaking and critical thinking, um, because science really is one big argument <laughs> where we're making that claim and supporting with evidence and demonstrating that reasoning. Um, and then they also wanted resources to support that content to balance. So if I had typically been used to teaching chemistry classes and now I was teaching an integrated course, um, teachers identified that they wanted that textbook support for chemistry and or physics content. So I'm going to turn it over then to um, Ms. Shoemaker. We'll talk a little bit about the resources and then the process that we went through um, as outlined in 6002. And I'll pass around books while you do that. Okay. What we determined was that um, we actually needed two textbooks because we could not come up with one that met our criteria. And this came about because the teachers that we asked to be on our committee, the teachers, the parents, the department chairman, and administrators, we came to a consensus that one book would not meet our needs. So after reviewing five physics books and six chemistry books, we determined that we needed these two resources, which um, are going around right now. We sent out our RFIs in December. We could not find one text, as I said, so we repeated the RFIs again in February. And after the review, we did come up with we need two textbooks. And please note that we followed all of the policies mm -hmm. and the rule of 6002. We had a committee of teachers, department chairs, resources, resource teachers, administrators, parents, and administrators were solicited to review for us. And the recommendation came back, the two books that um, you are now looking at. And so what I wanted to flip back as you're looking at the handout, what you'll notice is you'll see some of the language of the Alignment and Next Generation reference can see reference to the cross-cutting concepts. You'll also see opportunities for phenomena-based. So we have students really unpacking that scientific thinking. Um, on this particular example that you see on the slide, it talks about visual literacy, which I know in previous presentations of the board we've talked about is a critical part of the SAT um, and part of the revision to the SAT. So it's, um, it's really about building on that deep content, but aligned to these next generation science standards and that um, cross-cutting sort of triad, if you will, of the practices, core ideas, and cross-cutting concepts. Um, and so to get to the nitty gritty without going too deeply into um, the next committee meeting with contracts, we are going to purchase class sets. That is our goal of each of these for each teacher. So if Mr. Offerman was an IPC teacher, he would be receiving two class sets, a class set of the chemistry textbook and a class set of the physics textbook. Um, both of these textbooks will be a part of the professional learning. So we have curriculum that has been developed around phenomena in the way that's outlined in the next generation science standards where students are actually problem solving and applying, these resources will then be used to support that deep content and that learning through that literacy-based approach. Um, so do we have any, I know I'm going super fast, but I'm mindful of your other schedule. What is the, what grade is this? These would be oh, high school. High school courses. I'm high sorry. school. It's usually the third course. So is that typically 11th typically, grade? Typically 11th, but we do, some students do double up on science courses, so it's not exclusively right. 11th grade. And it's my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that science is gonna be a required HSA? We do actually have a science required assessment, yes. It's um, called the MESA, MESA, the Maryland Integrated Science Assessment. Changing though? Yes. It did, yes. New one so is the MESA. Do these? It changed in alignment with the next generation science standards. So we got standards, we got a new assessment, and now we're getting new resources to support the new curriculum. Thank you. That yep. was my question. Tying it all together. I saw where you're going. It's in total alignment. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, what is the mathematics requirement prior to, prior to the take, Great taking this course? Uh, students need a minimum of algebra. Algebra one? Mm -hmm. Algebra one. Algebra okay. one. Mm -hmm.
all thank, through. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you, Mr. Mucker. Okay, I'm going to roll right along. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Adams is helping me with my box of stuff. Our open court. So I, I'm sorry that this is at the end of the presentation, but this is our open court, our explicit phonics uh, that I know that there's great interest in. And uh, yes, so I'm back. I think this might be my to, third time, right? We're, <laughs> which we're is very great happy because to bring forward. Yes, this is really important. So I brought my friend everything. Leo the lion with me too. Uh -huh. So as you know, and, and we've been um, talking several times, and I just want to reference back at our previous presentation, and I know some of you still have the pipe cleaners, which I appreciate, um, because it <laughs> helps to them. provide that context, yep. Um, so as you remember, we talked about the challenge and the, all the different strands that need to be woven into skilled reading, and one that has been of particular um, focus, concern, I know that I'm sure you hear um, pretty consistently from community stakeholders as well, is this idea of developing phonics and phonemic awareness or that structured literacy approach. And um, so tonight what I'm here is to talk to you about this bottom half of the rope, specifically talking about phonemic awareness and phonics or that word recognition. And so if you remember from our conversations about reading, our goal is for students to become increasingly automatic and to base that instruction in a very explicit and systematic way where we're building on those skills um, to have that solid core of that tier one instruction. And so as outlined in 6002, we did engage in a um, process of putting out for bid this idea of looking for a comprehensive tier one. And what I mean by tier one is that this would be the program for all students. Um, we have far too many students that are still striving as readers when they get into intermediate grades. Um, and we have far too many students that are showing up as needing intervention. We know that we will always have a need, as Ms. Ryder talked about all the different needs, um, but we need to strengthen our core. We need to strengthen the initial instruction in phonics for all of our students to ensure that it's explicit and systematic um, and aligned to standards. So we put out an RFI last summer we had seven different vendors. Um, we brought together the evaluation committee as outlined in the policy and had a specific program criteria. These are all the stakeholders that participated. So we had reading specialists as well as classroom teachers and special educators. We had resource teachers from ELA, Title I, possibly ESOL, I'm not positive. Um, we had school-based administrators and we were able to have a representative of our Special Education Citizens Adv Advisory Council um, who also serves as part of that decoding dyslexia group um, to bring that level of community-based expertise as well. Um, our criteria was that it needed to be explicit and systematic. We wanted it to be based on all the years of research um, and certainly be validated by that evidence-based research, uh, aligned, of course, to our content expectations. We also really wanted a program that was going to include what we call um, ongoing or formative assessment um, so that teachers had those checkpoints that they could be using within the classroom as well as those benchmark assessments. And then specifically, as Dr. Sullivan just talked about, our population, of um, students, we wanted to make sure that we had specific suggestions for serving a variety of populations of students. Our English learners, of course, our students who may or may not have IEPs but may have an identified need in reading, and also for our advanced learners, um, and I'll talk more about that for a moment. And then specifically, of course, we're always looking for materials to be free from bias. Open Court scored significantly higher um, with our review panel on the overall program criteria. Um, these are just some of the comments. I won't read them to you, but um, the evaluators don't have to put comments, <laughs> and uh, many of them did because they saw um, so many of the supports that we've heard from teachers that they need. Um, we then moved to doing a field test of open court with these three elementary schools, um, which I mentioned last time I was here talking with you about Elmwood, Franklin, and Honeygo Elementary. And so tonight I wanted to share some of the data. We talked last time. Um, one of the major sources of both quantitative and qualitative data around bringing a program like this is about filling the needs of our teachers. Um, I talk a lot when I come up here about students and filling the needs of students, but it's equally important that we're supporting our teachers. And we know that 
that our teacher preparation programs are woefully underserving the needs of our teachers in terms of explicit reading instruction. Um, and we've talked a lot about all the different professional learning opportunities that we've provided, including Orton-Gillingham training and letters training, which have been very popular, but that still requires the teachers to put it all together in the classroom. Teachers are spending an inordinate amount of time um, pulling materials from different resources. And so in the survey, what teachers were um, responding so favorably to was that it was easy to use, there was a clear sequence, that they had the materials they needed, and of course, importantly, that the ultimate goal is their students were being successful. Um, and this is, again, some of the feedback they talked about. They could see that training coming to life in the materials. Um, and they could also see the differentiation and materials for parents and that strong homeschool connection, which we know is so critical for early reading. Then we also did want to bring in some quantitative data. And if you remember last time we were talking about, this is short. You know, when you bring a program new, and in one case, one of the schools didn't get to start until closer to October because of um, materials. Um, you can't necessarily assume everything is going to turn that quickly, but we were actually pleasantly surprised by the positive quantitative that we got, data that we got as well. Um, Dibbles is one screening tool that we use in kindergarten, um, and this is the percentage of students who grew from the fall benchmark to the winter benchmark, and you can see that um, those numbers are very exciting. Um, Again, this kindergarten Dibbles data addresses those primary skills, um, those early literacy skills of um, sounds, letters, and then phoneme segmentation is the idea of breaking it apart um, into individual sounds. At Honeygo Elementary, we um, wanted to also bring additional data from MAP. Um, Honeygo was able to administer MAP in fall and winter for their first grade. I know we did have some connectivity issues, but um, they actually had an increase in the percentage of students that scored in that high, high average range increased by 28% um, for first grade. Again, whenever you're looking at a program like this, there are a lot of factors that contribute to student success. You know, we have incredibly hardworking teachers and parents, and I can't necessarily sit here and say um, unequivocally it's because of this. But what I can show you is that that um, the program materials are providing teachers with that support they need to provide systematic and explicit instruction, which is working for students. Um, and then here's from Franklin Elementary. So they talked as well. Um, the principal of Franklin Elementary actually decided to look at cohorts of students. So rather than looking just in one grade level, he looked at what were the, where were these students in the winter of kindergarten. So if you look at um, the Dibbles data at the top, in the winter of 2018, so last winter when the, these students were in kindergarten, there were 61% students in the average and above average range. Today, as first graders, there are 78% of students in the average to above average range. Um, in his view, because his population is pretty stable, it's not entirely 100%, he wanted to see if I'm looking at a cohort of students, because this is a change from where they what they had instructionally in kindergarten to where they are in first grade. So his data is a little bit different, um, but I thought it was pretty powerful and spoke to. And then he followed the same thing with first grade to second grade. So looking this time at the same population of kids, um, which was slightly different. And he sent um, this feedback. Um, he wasn't able to be here tonight, um, but he I um, included his quote there that in terms of school progress planning, he was saying um, he really believes it was the systematic implementation of this program that he credits for seeing that change in his data. Um, and then our principal of the year, Ms. Banky, had hoped to be here tonight, and she wasn't able to, so I was able to get um, actually three very quick video clips that I'm going to share with you so um, because I know it tends to always be me up here talking to you and I wanted you to be able to have the opportunity to hear from them. I'm hoping Jeremy can turn the volume up for you. ...has really made for a really um, solid foundation as we've opened the school. Mm -hmm. We had teachers who joined us from all over Baltimore County. We were able to bring them together and do a firm commitment towards what is effective foundational skills instruction look like in our primary grades, K through three. And one of the things that our teachers have told us is that this is much easier to plan with. So we are seeing teachers who are gaining confidence in how to teach reading. 
I'm sorry, that got cut off. This is, <laughs> her what? video is actually longer. Um, this is a teacher that she also videoed from, from Honey Go. What do you like about open court? Oh, I love it, Miss <laughs> Fanky. I love that we have the visual vocabulary cards hanging on the wall and throughout the day, I notice my students refer back to those cards and those sound spellings whenever they're trying to sound out words. I love how we're reviewing multiple skills in the blending section of the lessons. I think that it's a lot of fun. I think that the kids really enjoy the open court program. I love how we have our workbooks where we can go in and practice. But the best thing about the open court program is having that decodable for the students to read every day to practice all of the skills that they're learning. Having that colored hands-on book is really what I think makes the program great. And I love it. Okay, and then next I will share with you, um, I went yesterday evening to meet with Miss Banky because she was so upset that she couldn't be here this evening. And so I said, yes, I'll come out. And then we were walking down the hallway and our next visitor, our parents, that happened to be there at a PTA meeting and she said, no, you have to hear from my parents because my parents are really excited about this too. So this um, nice woman who's next was gracious enough. Um, Jeremy, I think you need to click for me now. What? Um, Totally unplanned, <laughs> but she was gracious enough to Candy share camera. her story. So can you tell me about um, how, as a parent, you've experienced the phonics program with your own child? Yes, so my son is in kindergarten, um, and he could not read at all prior to coming to Honey Go. So he brings home the little paper booklets, and we read them together. And he's so proud of himself, and he's accomplished so much that he actually took a regular book, sat on a stool, and read it to about five or six adults from beginning to end. Awesome. Um, just from the school year alone and knows the paper books front to back when he brings them home. So I'm really excited about the progress he's made this year. Thank you. <laughs> um, she said, make sure that video doesn't end up, no, I said, I'll <laughs> take good care of it. Um, but I thought it was important that you hear, and again, this was really kind of unsolicited as we were walking down the hallway. Um, we know how important early reading, confidence in reading, teacher support, this is, this is where we really need to get it right. Um, there's new legislation that was just passed, really supporting this idea of how important structured literacy is, and, and I'm proud to say Baltimore County's been ahead in that regard and the work that we've done. Um, and this is our effort to really kind of bring it, bring it home and, and bring it into the classroom. So um, the details of the contract um, that would be coming forward, um, and the contract itself would cover a rollout up through grade three um, but the funding that we have for this year would be for kindergarten and grade one in the first year and then we would look to expand in our FY 21 request so the total of the contract would expand across those years um, the purchase is for this this is <laughs> this is actually what comes um, each teacher would get the entire kit as well as the word cards that the teacher referenced um, and those consumable materials that the parents referenced so those decodable readers that both the teacher and the parent um, referenced. Um, there is a digital component. Teachers will get physical grade book, um, guidebooks or, or teacher editions, and I actually have a sampler of that. Did I already? Yeah, I think you had passed Did that. I give that to you already? I've given you so many, that's it, yeah. <laughs> so that's just a sampler view. The teacher's um, edition is available digitally or print, so teachers, just like everyone else, could have a choice of, of how it works for them. Um, the primary purchase is for these classroom materials. There is a digital component for students, um, but it is mostly, it's supplemental. So it is um, independent practice games that they can do um, with headphones listening to different sounds or, or practicing some of the skills, but the majority of it would be for um, the materials you see here, including the Leo the Lion puppet. So. And Michelle, do you know the pricing? That's per what I was kit? just trying to pull up. So I'm gonna um, get that. So um, I'll have to. F I, I do have that. Let me try to get that for you. But the price is per kit. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions while I'm looking for that? I do have one question. Sure. Um, for comp for comparison purposes, and I don't expect you to have this now, but if you could send it out. Sure. Um, for the principal who looked at the cohort of kids, can mm -hmm. we compare that growth, From actually for before. both schools, mm -hmm. to for the kids who were included in the um, pilot and the kids who were not? So in these schools, we gave it to the whole school. We did not only, so you mean other schools? No, I, he mentioned that he wanted to look at the same population He looked at the entire grade level. So oh, what I did. meant by okay. that is he didn't just look kindergarten, fall to winter, he looked winter kindergarten to winter first. Okay. 
Thank you. I apologize if All that right. was unclear. Um, yes, so the um, classroom materials, the different grade levels are slightly different um, because they include different. So the range is anywhere from um, $800 to $1,200 per classroom. Mm -hmm. um, it is typically more expensive at kindergarten because they have more stuff. <laughs> um, and then there is um, the consumable cost um, that is included in the first year. Um, yes, it looks like the kindergarten classroom material is $1,200, and then it goes down. Grade one is 1000 and then uh, grade three is $900 a classroom. And then there is the um, consumable cost for the student material is around $125 or $130 a student um, for those consumable materials. So in the fall, I'm a kindergarten teacher, and I get this. Mm -hmm. And I begin to hand out the materials to my students. And mm -hmm. because it's designed that way or whatever, I don't get them back. Right. Um, am I allowed to copy them? <coughs> the, the different materials work differently. There are um, some of the consumables we do have copyright. And so the, again, yes, the teacher would be able to copy them. Um, the materials that we call consumable, we replenish every year. So part of the request would be for that built-in, we call it cost, so that if I've made the take-home books for them to take home, I don't expect them to come back. I want them to stay, and then I would get a new set that would come the following year for the duration of the contract. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any, anybody else have questions? Yeah, is, is there is there uh, an expectation of, of uh, how long the uh, entire kit, I don't mean the part that you replace every year, mm -hmm. sure. would, uh, would, mm -hmm. would, uh, would 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 uh, last? Well, it depends if students, you know, chew things and they <laughs> things like that. But um, I would say around six years is when we typically start looking to replace some things. Now, schools, we would ensure in the spending authority um, that schools and offices have an opportunity to replace. Sometimes things go missing, right. um, some of the smaller pieces. So that's kind of ongoing. Um, in general, I would say um, in years past with other things, sometimes when we go beyond that six to eight year mark, we're really kind of stretching it beyond its life and typically then there's a newer version and they've updated it and then it becomes hard to replace materials that's actually what happened to us before um, probably 12 or 14 years ago we had open court a different version um, there comes a point where we had it longer than the publisher had it available and so then when schools expanded or added classrooms we weren't able to supply it so that's usually the window but it's not perfect when was this version introduced do you know it is brand new. Brand I think the publication date is 2019. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. But I'll double check that. And just so that you know, when we um, do something new like this, we, our office curriculum and instruction budget provides that for schools, so right. you're not thinking that the schools have to find that money for them. We provide that for them. Um, and then uh, also with um, schools help with the replenishment year after year so there's some of those consumables then uh, but we always are ready so if you have a school where the population's grown and right. they suddenly now have two more sections of a grade we cover the cost for schools for that and are we we're not saying that this would totally replace like Orton Gillingham letters dibbles. No, no. So Orton Gillingham and letters is the training, okay. and so that really empowers our teachers. And Orton Gillingham instruction, we hope, would be very specialized. So we're looking for that to be the students that truly need something different. Um, so that would still always be the case. What we're seeing right now is too many kids are struggling because our core isn't solid. We want to make sure that that specialized instruction is really for the students who need it. But do we run the risk? Um, and I, you know, I advocated for this so but Great. are teachers gonna say oh my gosh this is one more thing or so we have 10,000 teachers so I can't say that they'll all say the same thing I will tell you that this is probably the thing I get asked about the most teachers and, and I've had teachers ask me about it teachers so. so I don't believe that will be the general consensus because this is a gap they are teaching phonics now so the standards have been in place that expectation they're just working really overtime to do it and it is not as systematic and explicit so I think this will be an answer to that ask um, the responsibility then falls on my 
my office and in our partnerships to support teachers through that professional learning. What's been wonderful is the reading specialists and the teachers. Um, I will share with you, um, the teachers that are piloting this keep saying, what can we do? How can we help make sure this stays? Um, and part of that is I've been engaging them and saying, well, what advice do you want me to know to help support teachers so it doesn't feel like one more thing? Um, and that also becomes in how we communicate with principals about supporting teachers because it is learning something new. Um, what I've heard universally from teachers is it's ease of use. It, this is, um, I'm an advocate for teacher as architect and planning curriculum. This is the moment of the day to follow the script. This is the moment of the day that you really can follow from top to bottom um, because then teachers are learning that routine and learning that explicit nature of phonics instruction. So I, I really do believe it'll be a win. I'm sure I will have some teachers that just because they want to do a good job may feel like, okay, it's something new I have to learn, but then that's my job to support them. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Motion to approve. <coughs> Second. All in favor? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Please you everyone for your time and be safe getting around the beltway. Thank you all very much. There's some extras, yes. Yeah,